Well, hey friends out there in YouTube land, Rob Ham here. Today I want to talk to you about the Panasonic CX-10, X1500, X2000 series of portable handheld small cameras. These are really great cameras. I enjoy using mine a lot. This is passing a little over six, seven months now, maybe more like nine. I'd like to share with you my updates and thoughts. Now, I know that you can't see it, but way back there in the background, I'm actually working on a wedding composition guide for great wedding photography, a course that we're gonna be bringing out here very soon. That's gonna be a free course. You'll be able to pick it up and check it out and enjoy it all that you like. All you have to do is subscribe. So hit that like button, subscribe now, and be ready for that course when it drops. Now, this camera is really interesting, okay? So I think there's a rise right now of the small sensor cameras, so much so that this camera, being a one over 2.5 inch sensor, is not the typical size sensor that you would see used on a wedding or a documentary show or something like that. But that's precisely where Panasonic has positioned this camera. And that's what I wanna talk about today. My use of the camera going over everything from low light, handheld shots, just the overall usability, the way that I use it, what role it's performed, and how I have enjoyed using the camera. Okay, with that being said, we're gonna talk about one thing, and that is the Amazon links and PayPal links down below. If you like this content and would enjoy supporting it, all you have to do is shop using those Amazon links down below, or send me a cup of coffee through PayPal if you would like. If you don't wanna do any of that, that's totally fine too. Please watch through to the end and leave a comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, as usual, this is a coffee cup kind of conversation, which means that these will be my meanderings and thoughts as they come forward, this is unscripted, so if you like that kind of video, grab your popcorn and come along with me. If you don't, then please switch to another video because this is going to get, well, <laughs> technical in the weeds. There's a few things I wanna talk about. First of all, how do I use it when it's set up? The camera itself, we can go ahead and turn it on, is actually set up using a Field World uh, 2200 nit viewfinder. I also use a transmitter on here. I usually use this as my B cam in a setup. I had been using it as my A cam. It really just depends on the lighting situation. If I'm outdoors, I will likely use this as my A cam. If I'm indoors, I will likely use this as my B cam. The reason is low light. We'll talk about low light in a little bit, but I want to get that out of the way up front. In order for this to work in this configuration setup as my B cam, this transmitter, which is an Atom uh, 500 transmitter from Vaxis, yeah, Vaxis, uh, it transmits to a receiver which looks just like this. I actually run the HDMI output into the Vaxis in order to transmit, and then from the Vaxis, I actually get my signal coming out over here to the field world monitor. Where might I send this video out to? It would actually be kind of incomplete to talk about how you use this camera as a B cam with wireless video if you didn't talk about the Yolo Box Pro right here that I use as my production monitor and live stream event. Now the Yolo Box has a lot of different features to it. I like it quite a bit. The Yolo Box Pro has some really upgraded features that make this whole system work well. However, the Panasonic series cameras do happen to have live streaming built into them. So why would I use Yolo Box Pro or Yolo Box over the Panasonic? Well, the reality is you get a lot more choices for how your production runs and you can manage a complete production. Yes, it is true. You can use RTMP server to set this up and actually send information out to or send a live stream out to YouTube or Facebook, things like that. But the reality is you're controlling one camera. With the Yolo Box series, you're gonna be controlling multiple cameras with a program monitor, as well as ability to add like SD videos or, or documents that you wanna show. You can actually set up your show and run that mobile. You might ask or wonder if I use anything different when I'm in studio. Do I use this uh, or do I use something like OBS? And it's a hybrid. Sometimes I use OBS, sometimes I use Yellow Box. But this, the nice part about here is the Panasonic CX1500, 2000, and CX10. Uh, actually, it's HCX for the other ones. But anyways, that doesn't matter. These cameras all recognize as a webcam when you plug them into the computer. Makes it much easier for streaming and things like that. So live streaming and use out of the way, let's talk about this monitor. The monitor is important because it's a 2200 nit monitor, which means that I can see it when it's outside. I set these up in this kind of an arrangement specifically so that when I'm monitoring my program from the side, I can actually be behind it or to the side of it and see what it is that I want. Normally I will be working to the side of my, my camera right here and I'll be, I'll be controlling the camera in different ways, right, like this, or one of my technicians will. But if we are behind, we also wanna be able to see as well. So we've got our regular screen right here, which is good for daylight once you turn the LCD brightness up, but it's not, not that great for harsh on the beach, sun, uh, sun, midday, weddings, and things like that. That can be kind of difficult. 
Um, and, and I guess just what I'm saying is here, this setup and arrangement works well for me. So we've got a side view and a uh, behind view. When we wrap around here to the side, you're gonna notice I've got a microphone, this little shotgun microphone, and there's a ceremonic microphone. I like it quite a bit. I think it's the VM1 series or whatever. I don't know, but it's plugged in right here. And I also use my Sennheiser XSWD wireless system. So I've got an onboard mic right there. Well, actually the onboard mic is here. I've got a shotgun mic right here, and then I have a wireless microphone right here. Now this system can be set up to go wireless to a lavalier mic, which is this configuration, or to you know just a regular wired mic or a shotgun microphone, anything you wanna put somewhere else. Sometimes I like to take a shotgun microphone, connect it to the XLR kit, put it on a boom, and now it's wireless. I don't have to have wires running up and down. It really just depends on how I wanna use it. In any event, it's important to note that those audio interfaces or audio devices actually get looked at and used with this top handle audio interface, which is really nice. The audio interface right here allows us to adjust our levels, phantom power, mic or line level input, auto level if we'd like, or adjust the gain from plus or minus, well, it's not marked, but it's really plus or minus 12 dBs on either side. Now we can actually, the reason it's not marked is because you can attenuate and set this up. It actually has a built-in video light right here, which I'm gonna turn on, maybe. Pretty bright little video light as you can see, and that video light can get pretty bright. In fact, this is extremely helpful when being used at nighttime. The problem is the video light is not by color, which means it's just a very white light with a lot of blue in it. You can use some correct orange filters on top of this, just stick them to it, which is great. And Panasonic really wants you to use this uh, light source because of the low light capabilities. And we'll talk about that now. This camera is a one over 2.5 inch sensor. From my uh, looking at one over 2.5 is right around seven times crop factor. So 1.8, we'll call it F2 times seven is 14. It's really right around an F11, F12 aperture uh, if you were looking at 35 millimeter equivalent. The reason that's important is because Panasonic is telling us that the 35 millimeter equivalent on this camera zoom range is uh, 25 to 600, like 24 times zoom. That's great. That's been converted into the uh, into 35 millimeter equivalent, but they're not telling that to us about <laughs> the lens aperture. So the aperture is one to four. So we do the math right there. Uh, seven times two is 14, it's 1.8. So it's about, it's about F11 to seven times four is 28. It's about uh, F11 to F22 is what the lens actually is in 35 millimeter equivalent, which means dark. Now, the reality is there are some ways to get some good low light coverage. First of all, work in a spot that's got um, a lot of spill light, a city street, a sunset, silhouette, work with silhouettes and your ambient light there. That will work quite a bit. In fact, my range test that I found out on a pier in Virginia Beach from seven months ago showed that I get beautiful sunsets at nighttime, gorgeous colors, nice cityscape from the pier, looking back on the beach and the water, really great. If you haven't seen that video, I'll link to it here. So I find that if you're actually in low light, in a spill environment, stop zooming, because we are using for the system a pretty bright aperture, which in fact is a couple of times brighter, maybe one and a half to two stops brighter than most other cameras that are even larger than this in other systems, even Panasonic's own system. The HCX1 also, if it was comparatively, has a dimmer widest aperture as well. Since we're here, let's talk about this little lens hood. I find it to be quite helpful and effective, but fiddly. We can open and close the diaphragm so that we've got some protection for the lens. We've got a 62 millimeter lens filter thread on the front if we wanted to put a circular polarizer or something on here. I don't think there is any need to put any kind of filter on this. There's, if you've got a, a glass or a UV filter, there'd be no need for that. And then it just fits back on. It's a little fiddly. You gotta find it just right, and then there we go. Also, it's really interesting. You can use this for some creative aspect to uh, beginning and ending a video. Uh, it's pretty nice. Now, let's go ahead and move on and talk about handling. Handling is something that's very important. The camera's very plasticky, and that doesn't bother me. What does bother me is the buttons. They're terrible. In fact, I like this camera a lot. I would never buy this camera had I actually used it first. That's simple. If I had rented this camera first, I would not have purchased it. And that's nothing to say about image quality. That has everything to do with the buttons. They are horrible. And I don't know how Panasonic screwed this up so bad, right? They really did. 
So if you were gonna buy this camera, I would say rent it first, or go to a place where you can get it in your hands and test it out. The buttons are terrible. Let me go ahead and talk about that. Number one, Panasonic, and this is a gripe session, so get ready for it. Number one, Panasonic has actually created this so that it's so small, there's no riser like on other cameras. Now, this is important. It's really just a shrunken down HCX1 or UX180 with some additional features. Now I've got an HC1 right here, which is very similar to the UX180. What I'd like to do is share with you on the side, the actual buttons are kicked out. You see how that kicks out? I don't know if you can tell, it may not be making a lot of sense to you, but there's a little ledge that wedges outward from the bottom of the camera. These buttons follow the contour of the camera underneath the camera. They're rounded, right? They go under the camera. That is so terrible. Like, it, it is just the absolute worst. It means that it's difficult to get to them right here. Sure, could I put them on a riser? Yeah, I could put this on a riser, rise it up 15 millimeters or something like that and get my finger in there easier. But that wouldn't make up for the fact that the clickiness and responsiveness is horrible. For example, if we look at the screen up here, and I'll zoom in on that, can you tell if we're in manual or not? Is there any way to know? Now, there's nothing else on the screen right now to confuse you. Did you see? The fact that you're in manual focus is only shown by a very small spot right there that says autofocus or manual focus, AF or MF. And if you might think that that would be okay, I would agree with you. If you had a positive click right here knowing that you actually switched, if you don't, then you have no idea whether you're in manual or autofocus right off the bat. That's because of the button. There's no positive pressure back so that you know that you actually clicked the button. These are horrible. They remind me of buttons on keyboards from the 1980s. They are terrible. Next thing is they don't click or have any responsiveness. And the rotary encoder is too small. Like when you miniaturize things, you can't miniaturize fingers. So Panasonic, you failed. You completely failed. Yes, this camera works well. No, it is not good to hold. In fact, it failed so bad, they knew it. They knew it and they fixed it by adding an app that you can use to control the camera. No live view, mind you, just the settings. So in order to work around the fact that they miniaturized this in order to hit a size and weight so they could say it's the smallest at the time, they sacrificed user ability. Well, maybe not user ability. They sacrificed user comfort and ergonomics. The next thing is the focus ring. I don't mind that we have only two rings. Usually you have three rings, one for aperture, uh, one for focus, uh, and one for zoom. Okay, that's fine that we only have two. It's a smart camera, right? It should be able to handle that. But the zoom rings are terrible. There's not enough throw. They are too gross. I can't get a smooth zoom. The fact that the sensor is so small as well means that my uh, close focus distance to infinity on this as it's set up is um, only, only a small turn, right? Now, this is an electronic zoom. It should be something that you could set. Nope, I can't set that. If you know that you can, let me know down in the comments below. I have everything set to the finest adjustments on here possible in the menu, and it just doesn't work out very well. All right, the next thing is the gain control, right? The gain control is horrible. It automatically wants to shoot up to 30 decibels if you don't set it in the menu, and that's terrible for indoors. Really, noise is going to creep in noticeably around 6 to 8 decibels. and Well, it's going to creep in around 6 to 8 decibels where you can notice it. It's usable up to about 16 at the max, maybe pushing it 18. That really depends on the lighting of the environment. But there is something that happens around 18 decibels that you can noticeably, noticeably see the sensor is working much, much harder. The processing is smearing the details and things like that. Now, you got to understand that. And that's not so bad when you use things like the light right there and the spill light and your environment, but it is something that you need to know. But when you push these buttons, they actually don't just allow you to adjust. Push, adjust with the rotary encoder, which is terrible, and then push again to set. No, no, they just switch between auto and manual. In order to actually adjust these different filters or these different settings, you actually need to find the setting you want to adjust, in this case shutter, by moving the rotary encoder and looking at the highlighted menu item pressing it in, <laughs> pressing the OK button, and then, sh uh, then rotating the actual jog wheel up and down. This, this is terrible. I mean, it's just horrible. Obviously, as you could imagine, trying to do this while filming with this camera, no good. 
Panasonic wants you to use this camera in auto. That's what they want. Now, to their credit, they did include an auto exposure as a user button. I like that one. I find that I do use this camera in several different auto modes, but not usually in full auto. Sometimes I will set my gain to auto gain, and I will set my aperture to wide open, and I will set my shutter speed to what I want, usually the 180 rule. And then I'll use my auto exposure button right there, AE level, to actually boost by up to two or minus two stops of whatever the auto feature is being used. So if it's gain and you haven't maxed out your gain yet, I set my gain level auto to 18 only. So if it's gain and I haven't maxed it out to 18 decibels, it'll boost it by two stops up to 18. If you've already maxed out at 18, it will not boost anymore. So you've got a control limit in there, which is really good. Same thing if, it's, if you've got your shutter set to auto as well, it will also use a combination of both of those in order to get the plus or minus two stops. And the nice part about it is you can also adjust that right here in the, uh, with the rotary encoder. You can adjust it by one third stop increments up and down. Now there is an interesting function where you can set the iris control ring to adjust your auto gain as well, or your auto exposure, and that works just as easily. So that control works well, and I thank, I thank Panasonic for that. I find that the dynamic range stretcher of this camera works very well. I don't have a problem with the dynamic range. I enjoy the 10-bit Kodak quite a bit. Now, if you were to ask me prior to purchasing, what's more important, bigger sensor or 10-bit for low light, I would have said, or just in general, I would have said 10-bit. However, given the opportunity again, even though this is an 8-bit sensor, I would put a lot more credit when comparing these two to the HCX1 UX180. Those cameras are not out of the party yet. They're not gone. In fact, if you're buying one of these today, you may want to consider the HCX1 or the UX180 for the larger sensor if you have low light needs. If you don't do a lot of color grading, I've graded a lot of images and a lot of videos with the HCX1 and you really need to nail it in camera. It's got a fine dynamic range, but messing with that Kodak over here and 150 megabits per second at the max just doesn't work out very well in most instances. A little bit of a light color grade works fine. Now, if you hit your videos with neat video noise reduction and then color grade, or if you choose to do it the other way, I've done it both ways and only sometimes do I see a difference, that can help out quite a bit with any of your footage. If you were to compare this camera to the Panasonic S5, well, the Panasonic S5 has several advantages over the uh, 1500, 2000, or CX10. But the CX10, 1500, or 2000 are no slouch when it comes to capabilities. What, of course, you will notice with anything is that the S5 is going to give you the best low light and regular image quality period because of that large full frame sensor. But do you have a 600 millimeter zoom lens for it? I sure don't, and definitely not at f4. If you're outside during the day, even up to, up to dusk and sunset, you're going to get great shots with this. It's when you move inside that things change. Now, you might have the impression that I don't like this camera just because I wouldn't buy it again. And that's actually not true. I like this camera quite a bit. I wouldn't buy it again because Panasonic did a horrible job on the buttons. I hope that in the next versions, which seem to be about four-year intervals, they actually take some of this constructive criticism into perspective and... Um, and do something about it. I've bought three Panasonic cameras. I think the cameras are great. I don't think that this implementation of minimization is great. Talk to Sony Panasonic. Ooh, that's a burn, isn't it? Sony makes small and usable with big fat finger buttons work well. Uh, hate to say it, not so much here. Okay, that's still a rant, but we're laugh about that because we're all friends watching this, right? You understand? So I'm going to tell you where I really like this camera. It's small. It's got a lot of power packed into a tiny package, and it works well. I like it. The auto function, when you do put it on full auto, you get face detect autofocus. Don't ask me why we can't get that in other modes, but you get it, and it works well. Oh, before I go on this rant about how much I love the camera, let me say one other thing. The autofocus is nervous. Man, it is constantly, mm. if you look in the background, it's always thinking. It thinks a lot more in low light situations, and where do I use this the most? Wedding receptions, wedding halls for the ceremony. So I have found that in order to get around that, I use the widest aperture, I bring in my own lights. These are things I would normally do, but I'm much more cautious about this. 
At the beginning of the video, I said I use this as an A cam when I'm outdoor weddings or when I'm just outdoors in general, and I use it as a B cam when I'm inside. And this is specifically for my video recording. I also use additional full frame cameras to record video because mirrorless cameras and camcorders, they're all kind of hybrid. But I like the functionality that I get with all of my time codes and all of my things syncing across with my audio and stuff like that. And getting back to it, that 10-bit 420 60 frames a second codec at 200 megabits per second, man, Panasonic nailed that one. Inside the camera, that's great. I'd actually like to show you where I think this camera really succeeds. If you are a mobile studio filmmaker, this is it right here. Add the iPad Pro. You add this sucker with that and you've got a way to really do some on-the-go filmmaking. If you're a travel vlogger, if you write for a company, uh, food or do reviews like that, you could actually use your camera and your cell phone for detailed product shots of pictures and use this for all your video. That 24 times zoom is no joke. Up to 600 millimeters is something else. The handheld stabilization works very well too. The issue that I have with it is, well, exactly what you would think. At 600 meters or millimeters zoomed in, handheld stabilized footage is tough. You're going to want to have it on a tripod of some sort or at least a monopod if you can. But yeah, once again, I just bring my footage in, I import it right here, next thing you know, it's good to go. I like it quite a bit for those specific reasons. One other thing to like about the camera is that it will work with both screens at the same time. Just pull out your uh, viewfinder in the back and it won't turn off when you actually turn it around. Should you wanna turn it off, you can actually do that with the main button in there, that'll power right off. But here, it's actually still working. If you can see, everything's closed up. Now, the minute that we close this, it will actually turn the entire camera off. So it wor will work with both on at the same time, and you can worry about your light spillage if you need to, if you're in a dimly lit environment and you want to stay dark, by actually closing up some of this, probably be a good idea to not even use the monitor at that point. Let's pretend you just wanted to use the camera as it was. What would that look like? Well, that's actually pretty simple. You can get rid of this top handle, and now, you've got a really mobile, small, portable package that works great for you. I don't use this like this very often, but there are some times that I do, and that will be whenever I have to put the camera in an area that's up tall, somewhere far away, I will actually just pull out the screen, turn it down, I'll put it on a gorilla pod and mount it somewhere. And it seems to do quite well like that. Obviously, you have to be careful because this has some weight and gorilla pods are only as strong as they can be, but they've been pretty strong when I put this on like uh, different shelving units and things up high. Uh, it's worked very nicely there. The difference is you won't be able to get the kind of image that you want. You won't be able to zoom or anything, but if you have the app, you can. You can zoom, you can change your settings. So that's very helpful. Let's talk about some of the software things the app and the live stream, they take a little bit of time to set up. You do not want to be doing this for the first time on location. Trust me, it's not a fun experience. I know from experience. You would think that companies could actually make their products just pair appropriately like they're supposed to using QR codes or whatever, but no. Generally speaking, you have to enter the information manually for your live stream on this. If you have it paired to the app, you can enter it in the app and then save it over. However, if you haven't paired it to the app, it's almost as difficult to pair it to the app as it is the first time you're trying to set up your live stream uh, RTMP server and everything like that. So let's just say this, be prepared. So get your gear set up in the first place, right the first time, and you'll be happy. Guys, I have really enjoyed this camera. It is pretty simple. Notice the top handle is extraordinarily helpful. <laughs> let's go ahead and put this back on so that you guys can enjoy what that looks like. It just fits down, slides forward, and then screws into place, as you can see me doing. It really is that simple to plug this thing back in and have everything good to go. Look, she's already reading again. So friends, this has been my thoughts after seven months of use of using this camera on location for fun as well as for paid video gigs. Let's talk about the differences in the models on the outro. Well, the model, as you would see right here, actually without the top handle, is the HCX 1500. That is just the camera unit alone. When you add the top handle, you change the name to the HCX 2000, but you get an SDI port right here, 3G SDI at 10 bit. There is a difference here, something important to note, and that is that you can get the HCX 1500 like I have and the top handle without the 3G SDI port and save about 200 bucks. If you need the 3G SDI port, go ahead and get it. You'll come with both and you'll get the 3G SDI port. But if you don't, save a couple hundred bucks and buy them separately or an even in a package deal like I got this one from Adorama. 
Uh, they bundled it together and I still saved the 200 bucks and I got a bunch of accessories. And then finally, when we have the CX-10, which is the broadcast version, you get a couple things. You don't get any improved software. They all use the exact same, but you do get some broadcast ready P2 profiles in that camera. You also get an addition to the SDI, you get an NDI adapter that plugs in over here, which is ethernet so that you can call, control the camera over NDI. If you need those things, you're gonna add about another three to $400 for that. So my suggestion to you, if you're like me and you don't need the broadcast ready SDI or NDI connections, or you don't need the P2 profiles, just go ahead and get the 1500. You will want the top handle and then buy the top handle separately. But other than that, the camera's great. I enjoy it quite a lot. And for its intended use, actually it punches up above its class. I use it for weddings. I use it for uh, corporate shoots and things like that. I use it for live streams. It's just an all around very good camera. And uh, on this exit, I've got a question for you. Is this part of the rise of the small format sensor cameras once again? I don't know, but I've got a DJI Osmo Pocket 2 coming in. I know they've been out for a while, but I wanted to check that. And it's got an even larger sensor than this. And I find that I really enjoy these smaller format cameras because I can get them into places. So guys, I'm Rob. I hope that you enjoyed this video. It's been a long one. I hope you had fun with your popcorn and snacks and left some comments down below. I can't wait to look at them, read and respond to them. And I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Thanks for watching.